Thiago Amparo. I'm from the FGV University here in Sao Paulo, and I'm here with Professor Byrne, from the, uh, Emeritus Professor from the University of Hamburg, that is teaching now in the Global Law Program. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about his course and his uh, impressions about Brazil. So, Professor, uh, thank you very much for <laughs> talking with us today. So, first, tell us a bit about your research areas and your background. So, uh, you come from Germany. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, thank you for inviting me here, uh, also for this interview. Um, <clears throat> my background is economics. I'm by training an economist, but I was uh, for many decades a professor of economics, mostly at the law school of the University of Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And I had, of course, to think about what kind of economics I should teach to law students <laughs> and then only as a professor when I was already a professor I became interested in law and economics mm -hmm. and started uh, working in this field and also publishing uh, and so I have my my main studies are um, on uh, the economic analysis of civil law of tort law contract law property and also to some extent cooperation. So that is my main body of work. But before I jumped into law and economics, I had worked in an institute as an assistant professor, uh, an institute for development studies at the University of Bochum, from where I also have my PhD. And there uh, I was exposed to development economics and development studies in a more general way. I la they later that was not so important uh, uh, anymore when I uh, was involved in contracts and torts mm -hmm. and so on. But I never l gave that fully up and became then uh, much more interested in it in the 1990s when it became more general, generally accepted that the law and institutions in general, that is norms and the violations of norms which are then punished in a way or sanctioned, that this plays a fundamental role for economic development. Mm -hmm. And that motivated me to write a book on this together with my co-author from um, the University of, of Berkeley, Berkeley School of Law, uh, Robert Kuta. We wrote a book on uh, called uh, uh, titled Solomon's Knot, um, in which we developed our views on the role of law and institutions mm -hmm. in economic development. That book is also translated into Brazilian mm -hmm. language; is mm -hmm. available here, and. Uh, uh, um, much, not most, but much of the teaching is also based on this book, mm -hmm. which um, uh, is from that time. And since then, I have also published some other work uh, on law and development. Mm -hmm. I'm engaged in this, and I've just uh, written, for instance, a paper on uh, takings and eminent domain mm -hmm. power uh, in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you started by saying that you start teaching uh, economics to lawyers or to law mm -hmm. students, and then after that you also yourself got engaged with the uh, with the studies of law and economics, and and here you are teaching a course uh, for in the global law program uh, on uh, law and development. And could you tell us a bit about uh, the continuation of this experience of teaching law students and master students and bachelor students? Um, the economics and the law and the relationship between law and, and development and law economic development. So what is the experience so far in the course here? Well, uh, I'm very glad to have this group. Uh, it, uh, it works very well and uh, they are active, they're participating. Mm -hmm. So it is fun to, uh, to teach here. <laughs> and what kind of um, issues you're discussing in classrooms? So you said that it's about the poverty of nations and law. So what are kind of issues you're discussing in class? Well, uh, of course, it's a whole bunch of uh, mm -hmm. issues. But we start with a comparison of different countries. Uh, and how 
they developed over the last 20, 30 years and what role the law played in these countries, uh, in this uh, course of development. So, for instance, we dealt with the situation and with the development of China, mm -hmm. which is extraordinary by all standards. Mm -hmm. So they have the highest growth rates, but of course growth is not everything, mm -hmm. but they have the uh, much better schooling for school children, including uh, uh, girls. Mm -hmm. They have uh, increased the life expectancy at birth uh, enormously, mm -hmm. uh, and they have reduced the uh, number of people living in absolute poverty um, by more than 80 percent wow. over the last 20 years. No other country has achieved mm -hmm. this. Uh, but so by all standards, this is an extraordinary success, mm -hmm. the Chinese development. But if you look at the law, um, China is not ranking very highly on the rule of law mm -hmm. index. So the law is not very strong in China. Mm -hmm. Now, what we know, however, from institutional economics is that without protecting property, private property, without investor protection, you don't have growth. Mm -hmm. And you don't have, have growth if you have no, if contracts are not enforced. So investor protection and contract enforcement are absolutely vital for growth. Even in China? So they use that is, that is a general, exception. yeah, that you have to have that investor mm -hmm. protection and uh, uh, enforcement of contract. But China has developed uh, or has had already very strong substitute institutions. Mm -hmm. That is, if the law does not work very well, then you have you know, people who are really distressed and have problems in their businesses. Uh, they go to court, sometimes it works, but if they have real big problems, they also can go to the Communist Party. Mm -hmm and complain there and then you know the party leader the local party leader invites people and they discuss the problem mm -hmm. and then he says well i think you paid too much for this company you should reduce the price uh -huh. you know <laughs> <laughs> like a mediation or all yeah sorts. and and he has the power to you uh -huh. know nobody can say i i don't care what uh -huh, the party uh -huh. secretary said this is very important in China, mm -hmm. and you know the, the, there is a kind of symbiosis mm -hmm. between a between the Communist Party mm -hmm. uh, and the civil service and the economy mm -hmm. and the political system, and that this mixture of um, market economy move to the market economy and an institutional structure which is not just rule of law but also substitute institutions mm -hmm. that um, explains to a large uh -huh. extent the enormous success in China. And then we look at the counter example. Mm -hmm. The counter example of China is Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, in China they started the economic reforms almost at the same time when the communist system collapsed, mm -hmm. a little before, but mm -hmm. so the communist system in Russia collapsed in 1989. And what Russia did after 1990 was to jump into market, the market economy with one step, mm -hmm. you know, with radical reforms. Mm -hmm. All the state uh, enterprises were uh, nationalized and uh, people's owned firms, mm -hmm. they were privatized. But unlike in China, Russia had no legal system. Mm -hmm. and so they jumped, some, to, to they jumped into, they the jumped from socialism, for... exactly from socialism, they jumped into a market economy without having any institutions. Mm -hmm. 
They had not the law and they had no substitute institution mm -hmm. because the Communist Party was, you know, simply disintegrated. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. And if you have this and you just introduce a market economy without an institutional underpinning of it, then what you get is gangster capitalism. Mm -hmm. So in no time, all the assets uh, of the Russian economy mm -hmm moved into the hands of uh, oligarchs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is a kind of uh, gangster capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it is, this is tragic. In my view, this is mm -hmm. a tragedy, what happened in Russia, because um, had they followed a different path, more like China, for instance, mm -hmm. not to destroy, some institutions to keep China. some in, mm -hmm. things in place, they must, must uh, should have been done better. So the Russian national income after the collapse of communism declined by almost 50 percent wow. and then gradually um, increased again. Mm -hmm. But Russia achieved the level of uh, what they had in 1989 only after 15 years, and I think in 2006 or seven, they reached the same level they had mm -hmm. under communist wow. times. And even today, Russia is not doing well. Mm -hmm. You know, Germany is a country which imports goods from all over the world, but from Russia we can buy no produce, no, let's say, no industrial goods. Mm -hmm. You don't find them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just gas and oil and things well, like that, you know. And, and, uh, and Professor, one thing that you mentioned uh, with examples of China and Russia, and I believe that you were discussing that in the class, um, that in the end of the day, legal reforms and also institutions matter a lot for the development. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the situation in Brazil um, now with the several um, pro proposed uh, legal reforms being proposed and, and, and discussing about mm -hmm. to, uh, how to reform the system in Brazil? So where the um, Brazil fits in these uh, two counter examples that you gave? Yeah, that's a, a very uh, important Difficult, also difficult <laughs> question. It's not a test, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you this, when we wrote, when I wrote this book with Bob Kuta, we did a, uh, we uh, produced some graphs on Latin America, mm -hmm. did some statistical exercise. And as you might remember, in the early 1980s, late 70s and early 1980s, you had a, there was a, you know, a new development strategy mm -hmm. called the Washington Consensus, yes. right? So all Latin, America country, uh, Latin American countries had, until 1980, um, followed a development strategy which was um, state-led, mm -hmm. import substitution, uh, sheltering against the world market, uh, you know, that was a, a widespread development uh, strategy which also the Latin American countries, including Brazil, followed. But in the 1970s, there, were, um, there was so much literature coming up saying that this strategy does not work very well. It, it worked much less, well, it uh, was much worse than all those countries which had opened mm -hmm. up to the world market, exported mm -hmm. uh, where they had comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. And so it became uh, the new strategy to say we have to liberalize the economy, to privatize the state companies, uh, and to produce for the world market. Uh, so that, that was uh, the common strategy of uh, what we call the Washington Consensus mm -hmm. for Latin America. It was a strategy for Latin America. Mm -hmm. And now when you look in, eight, in the, let's say roughly 1980, all countries, Mexico, Brazil, but Argentina, other, many countries mm -hmm. in Latin America made very um, far-reaching legal reforms in that direction. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at how the economy developed, you should have uh, expected that, the, you know, for, before it was low, the, develop, the, the growth rates were relatively low, now you would expect a steeper mm -hmm. development. 
But exactly the opposite happened. Wow. Exactly the opposite. So when these liberal reforms were introduced in the next 20 years from, uh, from uh, 1980 mm -hmm. to 2000, 2002, 2003, in most Latin American countries, including Brazil, the economy stagnated. We were, when we saw these figures, and these mm -hmm. figures are totally undisputed, uh, we could not believe them because we, we thought that mm -hmm. should have some, you know, the market economy should have some positive effect. Mm -hmm. But uh, our take was then that in Brazil, in Mexico, Argentina, not so much in Chile, which is a very successful country, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, what, what these countries experienced was a mild form, a very, not, not comparable, but somewhat you know, a mild form of um, what we could see in the Soviet, in Russia. That is, if you jump, mm -hmm. you know, in a radical reform from, uh, let's say, from a state-led mm -hmm. economy to a market economy, but the institutions are weak, the legal mm -hmm. system is weak, and you do not have the substitute institution like mm -hmm. in China, then it cannot work. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think that the, that the market-oriented reforms are in principle right, in principle it's a good, good thing to do, but they must be underpinned, they must mm -hmm. stand on a fundament of, mm -hmm. uh, of functioning institutions. And I think that Brazil will do much better uh, the more it develops its institution. Mm -hmm. It's legal that people can trust mm -hmm. on that their property is not taken away, that their, that their investment is protected, and that the fruits of their uh, uh, investments, mm -hmm. uh, they can use it. Or and investigation that, does not last for, uh, last for many, many years. Uh, things, things like, like that, court delays. So I think uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the policy is in place mm -hmm. in Brazil, uh, but the institutional framework uh, is still, if that will be, can be improved, mm -hmm. then I, can, I, th I don't think there's any reason not to believe that mm -hmm. uh, Brazil can it make to the top. Yeah. And you very, see, uh, uh -huh. if I may add this, uh, we have, you know, we, we found this pattern mm -hmm. uh, that after the market-oriented reforms, in Latin America, you had uh, stagnation in many mm -hmm. countries. The only exception was Chile. Mm -hmm. Why? Chile, you know, and we, I th we think that in Chile, the institutional structure is better than in many mm -hmm. other Latin American countries. So they had uh, the institutions in place in order to keep up with the, with the economic growth and development. It seems right? to me. Yeah. Yeah. And one interesting thing that um, you discuss poverty in, in your in your classroom, and, mm -hmm. then, uh, and, and I believe inequality and issues like this in are very important mm -hmm. when you discuss mm -hmm. the context of Brazil. When we see that the poverty levels they decline uh, in the, for the past decades, but then now it's it starts to indicate that um, it uh, it starts to increase again the levels of, of poverty in Brazil. So um, it's very important your lesson that we need to keep. Uh, the legal institutions in place and bear that in mind in order to have the reforms that we want to establish. Um, you came to Brazil uh, in to Rio, you mentioned to me, uh, to FGV in Rio uh, more or less recently, and then now you're in Sao Paulo. Do you have anything um, favorite about Brazil being fooled or anything that you, <laughs> that is more trivial that you like to say or, or no? Or you didn't have much time yeah. besides the conference room? <laughs> uh, well, you know, what was really uh, surprising for me on uh -huh. my first visit to Sao Paulo, we went, you know, I was here on a conference yeah. and they invited me to a fan very fancy restaurant. Uh -huh. And I thought the fancy restaurant in Brazil is, you know, you get such a big steak. Uh -huh, there, uh -huh, there. Uh -huh. But they did not, that it was all <laughs> Italian food. So they said, <laughs> Uh, it is. Yeah, we are much more <laughs> influenced here <laughs> yeah, by the Italians, yeah, yeah. and so the so I learned that the country is very diverse, yes, and yes, that and Sao Paulo is different 
from other parts yeah, of Brazil. Yeah, Sao Paulo is also especially the <laughs> home of very various immigrants from yeah, different yeah, parts, yeah, including yeah, Italians yeah, yeah. and so on. Uh -huh. And well, when people ask me what's my favorite food in Sao Paulo, I usually say Japanese food. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you have a lot of yeah, yeah. Uh, cultural diversity. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. well, do you have anything else to say, or, or that's uh, uh, do you you will stay here for the this week and then you come back to to Germany and yeah, I stay uh -huh. for this week and uh, from at the weekend I will travel to. Uh, Brasilia, uh -huh. where I have uh, also a, a colleague, and I'll give a, another talk next mm -hmm. week in Brasilia on consumer protection, oh, uh, problems of consumer protection, mm -hmm. legal problems, and uh, and then back uh, okay. to Germany. Okay, and thank you very much, Professor. Thank uh, you, and Thank you for your stay yeah, here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.